on the phone. It's always a pleasure to welcome to the program Matt Taibbi from Rolling Stone magazine. Hello, Matt. What's going on, Sam? Well, you know, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same, apparently. <laughs> Uh, yes, that is true. It is, um, you know, another day, another bank that is not just uh, too big to fail, apparently, but uh, too big to uh, suffer any accountability, um, regardless of what they seem to do. Uh, right. Th- th- of course, we're talking about the HSBC settlement that was announced, I guess, earlier this week, last week, uh, end of last week. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about HSBC as an institution. Well, it's a it's a, a storied uh, British financial institution, one of the largest banks in the world. It um, uh, its origins trace back to the British colonial days, Hong Kong, um, and it's uh, again it's 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 one of one of the largest. Ten banks in the world for sure, um, and it got caught up in what is looking like the largest money laundering story in the history of banking. Uh, and uh, it, the announcement last week by the um, U.S. Justice Department essentially uh, gives the entire um, the collection of people involved in, in the activity, the illegal activity. Um, uh, a, a giant pass on on everything. Uh, there, there's going to be no individual criminal criminal prosecutions, even though uh, they laundered uh, as much as nine billion dollars for groups connected to Al Qaeda, to uh, Hamas, uh, and then Colombian and Mexican drug cartels. So um, it's a pretty amazing story. It well, was, it was, even even on Wall Street, people were pretty freaked out about it. In their defense, uh, do we know if they laundered any money for serial killers? <laughs> right. I mean, do we don't. They... Yeah, we, we don't know that for for certain. Yeah, there's no there's no conclusive evidence on that. Score, Although so, I guess yeah. I mean on a technical level, there's an argument to be made that these drug cartels are are in fact serial killers, as are. Uh, these uh, terrorist organizations, but I, I, I was really, you know, trying to cut them some slack, but you digress. and uh, right. you know, just some individual ones, you know, sort of ones who aren't, <laughs> who are just doing it for fun, uh, <laughs> as opposed for profit. Uh, so, right. Um, right. And, and and they're not doing it for child pornography producers that we know of, right? I mean, so right. I'm just trying, right. to, uh, you know, I'm just trying to, I want to, I want to try and be fair here. Um, now they were they were engaging these activities uh, over the course of uh, of up to fifteen years. Is that right? Yeah, and what's what's kind of amazing about this is that um, <laughs> back in two thousand and ten, and this is a this is a point in the story that most people don't know about or think about. Um, they were already approached by the government back two years ago, um, and given a cease and desist letter by the FBI uh, and essentially told, we know that you're laundering money for all of these various groups. Uh, we command you to take steps A through Z to stop doing it, including hiring extra personnel uh, to um, prevent this kind of activity. Um, and... The punishment for violating the terms of that cease and desist letter was essentially another cease and desist letter. In other words, they promised not to do it again in 2010. They got caught for doing it again brazenly and on a massive scale. Uh, and the punishment is they got to say that they were sorry. Actually, the quote was they were profoundly sorry. Yes. Um, and uh, and they paid a fine, and then they walked away from it. The The... This dynamic basically reminds me of the dynamic I have with my seven-year-old daughter, where I tell her, (laughs) you know, don't do this again, or uh, something bad's going to happen, and um, then I basically tell her that same thing again. Um, Right. And I can can assure you, uh, uh, I can assure folks that that's not an effective uh, uh, means of stopping behavior. Uh, but ostensibly, the FBI, you know, they 
they have more than just computers to write letters on, right? I mean, they have, they're like policemen. <laughs> Not only are they like police, um, <laughs> they, they reportedly are, are, are police. Uh, and what's, what's amazing about this is that um, frequently when you get a financial settlement instead of a criminal prosecution, uh, what that signals is is that the authorities know what happened, but they don't have the evidence to, to go forward, right? So like in the Abacus case, which is the, the Goldman Sachs case where, um, you know, Goldman was involved in helping a hedge fund swindle a couple of uh, European banks. Well, Goldman got fined $575 million, which is a ton of money, um, but they didn't go the extra step of really pressing a lot of criminal cases in that, in that instance because it was an extremely difficult um, activity to, to prove. Uh, the crime was hard to define, and so what everybody kind of took from that settlement was you know, the government knew what happened, but they, they just couldn't prove it. That's not the case here. They, they, in this case, they had whistleblowers, they had documentary evidence, they had um, admissions from the company uh, that they had violated um, at least four major banking laws, including the Trading with the Enemy Act uh, and the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, and so they they could have just gone wild with these people. And, you know, I mean, as you know, with terrorist prosecutions in the last uh, decade, if you have even an association with terrorism, they can do all kinds of things uh, up, up to and including, you know, whisking you away in the middle of the night and without a trial and, and you know, taking you somewhere forever. Uh, and they eschewed all of those options and, and just essentially publicly announced that they're not going to, they're not even going to prosecute. I mean, that, that's what's so sort of uh, revealing and, and egregious about this is that we have heard for years now that it's really hard to prosecute these uh, securities violation cases. It's really hard to prove the massive mortgage fraud that took place. It's really hard to prove. But these are these are not simple cases. It's very very hard to do. We don't have the resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now we hear the same reasons as to why we're not prosecuting, except for that one. Right. We're not hearing right. that it's too hard for us to prosecute. It's just that we just don't prosecute banks like this. I mean, it, it, tell me what the official uh, Lanny Brewer um, uh, uh, reasons are as to why there are no criminal prosecutions of HSBC for laundering billions of dollars uh, for ostensibly. I mean, We'll get into this, but when we talk about the hundreds of billions of dollars that we use, uh, trillions of dollars probably at this point, to uh, fight supposedly the supposed drug war, the war on terrorism, all this, uh, we have heard time and time again that the key is to get their financing, uh, but the biggest, at least that we know of, the biggest sort of conduit for this financing walks away. Right, yeah, no, that's that's what so incredible about it is that we have this we've co committed this massive expenditure of resources to uh to a war in iraq uh to a war in afghanistan to um you know the drug war uh we appear to be totally committed to putting yeah you know extending the absolutely maximum sentences allowable to anybody connected with either terrorism or drugs and yet here we have, you know, the heart of, of two of, of both of those things. The, you know, the, here's, here's where the money is. Here, here, you know, here are the high-level negotiations that allow these people to do business. And nothing, you know. I mean, that's, they, they, they didn't offer really an explanation publicly for why they didn't proceed criminally. Um, there was a lot of, from what I understand, off-the-record talk uh, which is why you saw it reported in newspapers like the New York Times um, that the reason that they didn't go forward is because they were afraid about systemic concerns, um, uh, you know, the impact of the collapse of a company 
uh, like HSBC, which is bogus on a number of levels. Like, you know, first of all, they the guilty parties could easily have been uh, removed, and in fact were removed uh, from HSBC without uh, permanent damage to the company. Um, so, you know, if if you're going to fire somebody, if you're going to demand that certain people are going to be fired, why can't they, these individuals be criminally prosecuted as well? Um, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, there, there, there can't possibly be any realistic uh, concerns about you know worldwide uh, confidence in, in the financial system if uh, if you're asking for these people to be fired but not prosecuted. So we have a situation where uh, Lenny Brewer is saying off the record, that, or at least uh, in background, or you know, I think he's been, the quotes have been attributed to him. Um, so maybe it's it's you know just not oh, a okay. formal yeah. official statement, but he's saying these banks are too big to fail. We're afraid of uh, people losing their jobs. Uh, we're afraid right. of the uh, financial implications. But we've already supposedly. HSBC claims that we have basically carved out these uh, bad apples. Presumably, these guys are going to work for other banks. Um, and so the idea that we can't go and have these individuals be held criminally liable is, is a joke. It's an absolute... Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's in Brewer's announcement that we, this, this bank has already been forced to replace most of its senior management. So... So, so I, I, these I guys are going I, on. I, what are they? They put themselves on the market. Like you know, I've got a good client base. Um, you know, these uh, I know where you. You know, uh, I can do for you what I did for H H B S C H S B C. And from H B H S B C standpoint, if they've got to pay a one point six, what is it? One point six billion dollar fine. Um, I think it's one point nine. Yeah. All right, yeah. one point nine. Let's call. It. So they're twenty you know, percent. It's like a check cashing fee, right? I'm going to right. pay 20% off of the profits we made. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Right, right. And again, wh- how, what, what's the percentage that they take from a person in an ordinary drug case? It's 100%. I mean, it's, it's, if you are caught up in, uh, you know, uh, if you're a, a weed dealer and you get caught up in a federal investigation and, you know, they start rolling witnesses up against you, um, what are they going to take? They're going to take everything you have. They're going to take your house. They're going to take your bank account. They're going to take your wife's property. Um, they're they're going to take your cars. Uh, and you know, as you know, in these civil asset forfeiture cases, they will actually launch uh, independent prosecutions against pieces of property. You know, it'll, it'll be like United States versus you know, 1300, you know, Maple Avenue, uh, and they'll take the house independent of what happens with your drug case. Um, so they've always, the, the, the strategy with, with drug uh, cases has always been, let's be as aggressive as possible uh, in, in extracting value and, and extracting fines from the people involved in this kind of activity. In this case, they took, they, it looks like they took the minimum amount that they could take um, that that would that would look like a, a real fine that would still be a record fine, but would uh, but would still leave the company not only viable in the long term but but for the, but profitable this year. And 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 we should say that I mean that amounts to what like a, like a, like a series of days of their profits, right? I mean, uh, what's yeah, it? The- it- it's. Uh, I saw one report that said five weeks. You know, it it, it could be uh, another report. It was seven weeks. You know, of, wow. of profits. So it's. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's ridiculous. And 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 again, it, it doesn't. It, it, this is the bank's money. It's not. It's not the money um, of the individuals involved. If this was a normal drug case, they would have gone into every executive's. Uh, you know, any executive who would, had been involved in this activity, they would have gone to his, into taking his house, his car, his bank account, and they would have they would have started nosing around in his relatives' uh, assets as well. Um, and they didn't do any of that here. Uh, and and here's the other thing that's amazing about it: in a typical drug case, they never tell you when they're finished. You know, they they don't they don't announce to you. By the way, we've finished investigating you. We finished taking your stuff. Um, you can go move to Montana now and not worry about the future. Um, 
you just you, the, the cloud of suspicion never gets lifted from you. In this case, they went and they held a press conference and they essentially told the entire world that we're just not going to do anything. So that's another way that makes the thing that, 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 that this is different from a normal a normal drug case. And we should say, uh, I mean, uh, well, all right, before we get to sort of the the broader implications of this, because you know, uh, this is rather than maintaining the integrity of our banking system, it's basically <laughs> saying, you know, here's what the the bottom line is, guys. Uh, we're going to need a twenty percent vig off of uh, whatever your take is, essentially. Um, but before we get that, this this um, this really this is a really uh, a harsh. Um, element of this, particularly since we're we're nearing the end of the year, and uh, we know how important bonuses are to these bankers. Um, <laughs> you quoted from Brewer's announcement in your piece uh, at RollingStone.com about this. I, I got to read this because it is so. Um, it it's, it's just surreal. It's surreal. As a result of the government's investigation, HSBC has quote clawed back deferred compensation bonuses given to some of its most senior U.S. anti-money laundering and compliance officers and agreed to partially defer bonus compensation for most of its senior officials during the five-year period of the deferred prosecution agreement. Uh, give us, <laughs> what, just, you know, clarify for us what that means. So some of the top executives will have to wait uh, to receive some of their bonuses for five years. Mm. <laughs> so, so some people will receive everything on time. Some people will receive most of their bonuses on time, but will have to wait a little while uh, to, uh, to receive it. But, the, the, you know, <laughs> they, they couldn't possibly have parsed it more. Uh, you know, our punishment is you have to, you get everything uh, that you're, you know, all of your ill-gotten gains you get to keep. Um, but you might have to wait uh, a little while in some cases. This is <laughs> so. a th- this is a one <laughs> sentence uh, um, uh, statement that has the word "some," partially, "defer," "most." Right. I mean, this is just like this sounds like this three guys who we basically said. You guys are just going to have to wait, but we'll put it in an interest accruing account or something. Uh, you know, as a, I'm sure right. that the, we, we've a actually CD invested or... it in your own uh, drug uh, laundering money operation, <laughs> so you should do quite well. <laughs> yeah, no, again, uh, if, if a real prosecutor, uh, when they're facing a bank that had already admitted to violating the Trading with the Enemy Act. I mean, again, if you think about what they did to other people where they're, they're taking them and putting them on planes and C-130s and, and flying them to Guantanamo Bay in the middle of the night or Syria or someplace and you know, skipping the due process altogether, uh, and then you contrast it with this, where they don't even take the bonuses away, uh, they 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 beg them pretty please to you know uh, defer it a little bit in some cases. Um, it's just I, I, I uh, one one prosecutor put it to me this way: that just these guys have no balls. They're not uh, you, know, you know a natural prosecutor's instinct is just to be is to have that thing inside you that's just like, I'm going to get these guys, you know. They, they, you just want to get the bad guys, and you want to make, make them hurt. And that's just, that pugnacity is, is, is supposed to be part of the, the profile of this job. And this is exactly what you don't have in this Justice Department. These, these people are, you know, they're not the Jack McCoy that you see in, uh, in Law and Order, you know. They just, they just don't want to. They want to work with the people that they're prosecuting. It's just, it's just weird more than anything. I, you you know, that, I don't know. That's a great point. I know, uh, I know a guy who is, um, who is, uh, uh, who is a assistant USA, and I got to imagine that because the you know uh, Lenny Brewer, I think, uh, came uh, with uh, with Holder from uh, was it Covington and uh, some right. white shoe law firm. And so exactly. these guys are Defense all sort firm. of used to sort of transactional, and they've all been working on the other side of the coin here, as it were. And um, I can imagine th- at one point, I mean, you know, 
the the scare tactics of like, look, this is really difficult. This is about uh, complex financial instruments, and uh, this is a very tenuous uh, financial uh, you know system. Uh, we can't go after them for this stuff that we don't really understand about. But this is just sort of cops and robbers stuff. And I got to imagine this is one of the most demoralizing things for people who are um, career prosecutors, who are young prosecutors, right. who are sitting in the Department of Justice going. What's it going to take? I mean, would they, if these senior executives, um, you know, killed somebody in their bank, but as long as they were using, like, eh, they used a safe, we can't touch them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's completely demoralizing. That's and that's what you know, you're going to be hearing from people who are real prosecutors. I think I, I don't I don't think it's a surprise that two of the biggest critics of this deal were Neil Borowski and and uh, and Elliot Spitzer. Uh, who are exactly those kinds of prosecutors who, um, you know, the, the way they look at it, they, you know, they don't come from those white shoe law firms where the way you approach a problem is to get everybody in a room and work it out so that everybody comes out happy. That's, that's not the way prosecuting works. The, you know, when you're a prosecutor, you represent the people, and your job is to take the biggest bite out of a criminal you can take. Uh, and it, 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 assuming, of course, that he's guilty and that he's done something terribly wrong, if, if there are mitigating circumstances, it's his job to take that into consideration as well. But that's not the case here. This, this is a case where um, a bank that had plenty of other ways to make money legally, and, and if you look around the, 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 the financial landscape, nobody's doing poorly, I mean, among these too big to fail banks. They're, they're, they're all making plenty of money. And what they did is they they entered into financial arrangements with with mass murderers. Uh, and so, if you're a prosecutor, you have these guys by by the you know the proverbial short and curlies. You you should be able to 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 you know exact the the wrath of, of the people. You know that 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 should be your job. That should be everything that you're thinking about. And these guys think in exactly the opposite direction. They're just that's just not who they are, and that's that's the problem. It's not like we need a new policy here. We need a new law here. We just need different people doing this job. You know, the, one of the things I think that people, when they when they read this story or or they just see the headline, they assume that there is some measure of complication here. Like, you know, it it was just sort of like a certain level of incompetence and poor double checking in the bank system, but literally. <laughs> One of the stories that you talked about in this piece is the way that these guys would show up with the cash that they were laundering. Right. Tell, tell us about that, because that, this is just, it's amazing. Yeah, I think it was the Sinaloa drug cartel, the Mexican drug cartel. They, they were bringing hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash into HSBC branches at a time. Um, and now, now, where are these branches? Are these like in small Mexico. villages in yeah. Mexico? Or are they actually like in cities where, you know, this isn't just, you know, a country bumpkin is sitting at the teller. This is not, you know, this is not like uh, some type of regional bank or, you know, the, the local uh, credit union. The, the, there, are, uh, there are real sort of, um, uh, you know, standards and regulations, supposedly, that, uh, for an international bank like this. Yeah, well, I'm, I I don't know exactly where they where they did this. I'm assuming that they were in big cities, and you know, like HSBC is a is an internationally chartered institution, so they definitely have standards. That they you know they can't just open a bank in in the middle of nowhere and suddenly have a different set of rules that they adhere to in in the United States for you know bringing in money. They have to adhere to to their rules, the same rules all over the world. But these guys apparently were frustrated with the inefficiency with which they were uh, um, washing their their drug money and so they they built special boxes to fit in through HSBC's teller windows um, so that they would exactly conform to the dimensions of those teller windows so that they they could pack the boxes ahead of time and and just walk into the bank and slide them through the windows um, as efficiently as possible, which which tells you a lot of things. I mean, it tells you that they they've been, they were doing this long enough and planned to keep doing it long enough um, that they had to come up with a system. Uh, and it also tells you that there was so much money involved that they that you know a box that was a uh, an inch too small uh, on you know on the edges 
um, was a constraint, a serious constraint to them. So, I mean, it's just, it's just an incredible story. And, and the, the notion that this, this was something that was just uh, overlooked on a line item somewhere. Um, we know that's not true. There are, there are whistleblowers that have come forward that have been written about who um, have testified that uh, the bank knew about hundreds of alerts uh, and uh, for questionable uh, tra- transactions and, um, and was just routinely ignoring them and, and, and sending them through anyway. Uh, so it's, it's it's grotesque. This is this grotesque behavior that uh, that is being unpunished. And, and and we should say, I want to also take the, the to reiterate that the the chair of the bank did say that they were really really sorry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and what, what does this do? Okay. I mean, is there you know I, I I've read that supposedly this creates some uh, lack of confidence in the banking system, and I'm skeptical of that simply because it seems to be part and parcel of the banking system and that um, there is, you know, the major institutional players, are I, I get the feeling, are just like, yeah, of course. Of course this is part of the business. Uh, that, right. uh, you know, right. and um, it, it is edifying to know that uh, we have a guy in the Justice Department who is, um, who is not going to, uh, you know, uh, crack down on it in any type of meaningful way. Uh, it may raise the percentage of doing business, you know, you know, slightly. But that would have. We also had to hire more tellers to take all that cash, which is also right. a cost. I mean, these are all just sort of costs of doing business for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I think was humorous about the story is that when they were uh, sent the cease and desist letter a couple of years ago, and they were told to hire new personnel to to supervise. Uh, money laundering activities um, and to and to keep a closer eye on things. All they did is they took people from their credit card collections departments. You know the people who call up, um, you know, <laughs> uh, people who are delinquent in their accounts and say, "Are you you know is so and so home and where's that thirty one dollars that you owe us?" Um, they just took all of those people and they assigned and they uh, turned them into money laundering experts um, who were assigned to review alerts. For possible money laundering activity, uh, so I mean that's that's the kind of cost of doing business we're talking about. I mean they they didn't. So they take call like centers. They take people from their call centers, and with all due respect to people working at their call centers, but they basically say now you are uh, officers of the bank who are in charge of of making sure you're basically fraud control. Uh, uh, right. Yeah, you're you're, you're now going to be in charge of, of of looking at bank accounts and deciding whether or not this is like a Hamas or a uh, um, an Al Qaeda account. Um, and so that, that's that's exactly what they did. I I, I I don't I don't even know how to I don't even you know it's 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 so hard <laughs> to absorb this and it's also just you know it really does lay bare. Why we got no um, no prosecutions, no genuine investigations of what the banks were doing um, in terms of the financial crisis, because there's just no there there's just the, the 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 there's just no accountability for these banks, no matter what they do. It, it, it's just right. It's just stunning to me. And uh, I don't no, know. I mean, it, it, and it and it sends it sends the message to to um, to absolutely everybody uh, that. Uh, you know, you can do it again. Uh, I, think, right. I think that's that's the that's the number one thing that people got out of this is that is that um, you know no no individual consequence for any of the people involved in in this incredible activity um, means that uh, you know not only can you do it again and not have to worry, but uh, financially it still worked out to be a profitable. Um, thing for this bank because they paid a two billion dollar fine for laundering nine billion dollars, and you know that's only the what we know about. Um, yeah, there was a, a similar case involving a, a British bank called Standard Chartered, um, involving uh, uh, for violating sanctions with Iran. They were laundering uh, billions of dollars uh, through, through that country, and they paid the three hundred and forty-seven million dollar fine. So. Um, so what's the where's the downside? You know, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, 
you're not going to go to jail, you're not going to pay a fine, a personally a fine, and your company might actually make more money in the end. So that's the, the message to everybody all across the financial system is just take as much illegal money as you can and don't worry about it. 